Welcome. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We left a few minutes for all of you guys to join in. It does take a little bit of time. Uh, we will, uh, we had a, a lot of registrants for this uh, webinar. Let's see how many of you actually joined. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Bob, let's uh, welcome everybody and start with our uh, competency webinar. Comp EX competency. Okay, you can oh, do the presentation. Let me do this. Seems like I lost control. The option, request more control. Here we go. Uh, okay, guys, as I said, welcome to this webinar competency in the EX world or how to comply to it. We have collected several questions during the registration process and we will answer those at the end of the webinar. You can, during the entire time, use the question answer box. I see somebody already using it to ask questions. Good morning to you. Um, before we get to the webinar, I have to take a few moments, you know, in a few minutes to talk about GMI. Oh, for, let me see if I can have control. Okay, here we go. Well, first, let me introduce Bob. Okay, Bob, for those of you who have not met him yet, is a real expert in... Uh, hey, Bob. Uh, expert, I don't know. He is an expert. He is our guest and speaker for today. He has over 30 years of experience in the EX world as a Comp EX instructor and also an instructor for the ICEX Comp PC scheme. He's also an inspector and a member of the USUL STP committee, which means you know, he's very qualified for the job. So coming back to us, before we get to letting talk, I lost control, Bob. I don't Sorry know what about that. I hit, a, I hit a mouse accidentally, so. Okay, we got it. So let me take only very briefly a few moments to introduce you, GMI, who we are, what we do, and why we do it. So we are a safety company. We design, engineer, and manufacture a complete range of intrinsically safe and SIN certified devices, interfaces for most automation packages from BCS, fire and gas, BMS, SCADA, in every industrial session, sector, sorry. From oil and gas to petrochem, food and beverage, pharmaceutical. We have a long experience, over 40 years of experience, which we try to share with you today. And we are very proud to keep the entire process here in our headquarters near Milan, Italy. So we have 100% internal production engineering design in our facility. We are, on the other end, a global player present around the globe. Okay, here it is. Because we manufacture safety product, safety is so imperative to us, we take a lot of care in the manufacturing and design process. So we have state-of-the-art technology we implement. We have some patent on our product, some unique ideas. We have complete product traceability from the incoming components to the serial number that is coming to you guys. We can know the entire history of the product down to who tested it, the test report, the batch of the components that were installed onto it. We are, of course, ROS, REACH compliant, three TGs, and many other compliance. We have certified our facility SC3 for systematic capability up to SIL3. So not only our product are SIL3 certified, but also our, uh, what is our life cycle for a design and manufacture of an IS product. Uh, so we try to, you know, to make the world a better place to live in. Okay, these are the product we manufacture from IS barriers to safety relays or safety relays with and without line monitoring, isolators, also SEAL certified. We have power supplies, EX and SEAL certified. We have multiplexers, we have termination board, we have heart multiplexer, we have surge protection devices, indicators, and we have a division of our company that runs a training and service group. So they, we manage uh, functional safety 
seminar webinars we are going to we were going to implement those you know this year but they probably happen next year because of the COVID. we will also have ex comp comp ex training and services as i said we are a local company but we are globally present so we have about eight today nine subsidiaries we just added one in australia we have many distributors around the globe we are about 200 people and we do run many courses today many webinars we have thousands of installations around the globe these are some of our customers we operate with most of the system vendors from APB to Yokogawa. Uh, four projects with all the EPCs, or many of the EPCs. And we apply our product in many packages, OEM packages, from gas turbo machinery comp compressor to uh, skids. Uh, I forget now one specific product that I wanted to mention, but then, yeah, many, many. Uh, we have a, a company that uh, cleans, uh, manufactures a machine that when the oil comes out of the, of the well, measures the content of the oil, the weight, uh, the, all of that is needed. And in that machine, there are our bears, for example. And we, have, uh, we are on the vendor list of many AVL, so many end user companies. Oops, I went too fast. <laughs> ah, God, it is morning to you, it's afternoon. Late afternoon to me, it looks like I'm getting to the end of it. Okay, so this is it. Well, you guys, you'll have a recording. So whatever we say, it's been recorded. Eventually, you'll be able to see it uh, in YouTube channel. So whatever I mess up, you can laugh at, at it later. <laughs> <laughs> now it's, it's Bob's time to talk. Uh, and to give us the presentation. I may disappear from the video, but I'm not going anywhere. I'm here to, to check your question and answer, okay? Fantastic. Well, it's all to you. All right, well, thank you, Paulo, and thank you all for participating, and good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon, wherever you guys are located in, in the world. Let's make sure I can control my screen. I think yeah, I can. I gave you control yes. again. That's thank it. You. Thank you. Welcome. So this is what we're going to be talking about today, competency in the EX world, how to comply. And um, it's, it's, I think, a very important topic, and I think it's a very informative topic. Uh, please ask questions, as Paulo uh, said, as we go along. I'll try to answer them as we go, but also we have some time at the end that we'll have some uh, chance to, to discuss a little bit further about some questions that you might have. Also, we appreciate the fact that you had given us some questions ahead of time. So we've added some of those questions in at the end of the presentation. So in order to understand competency, we have to define it and what is it? So competency, uh, in effect, it's a standardized requirement for an individual to properly perform a specific job or duty. So there are three legs of the competency triangle. So when we talk about EX, we talk about three legs of the, uh, the ignition triangle, if you will. Same thing holds true in competency. It's a combination of knowledge, what you might have learned uh, in books or through your studies or wherever it is, the skills that go along with it. So actually applying that information that you've learned and your behavior, whether or not you're able to do it over and over and over again. So it really is the combination of knowledge, skills, and behavior. So competency is not necessarily doing the same thing over and over and over again if you're not doing it right. Uh, and if you, um, and again, if your behavior, if you know what to do, but you don't do it, well, that's not being competent as well. So we really have three legs to define competency. And as an example, again, that ton of experience, we, we do a lot of training for people and, they, and part of the training that we do is actual practical installation of EX equipment, including cable glands. And we'll have a lot of students that'll come through our courses and they'll, they'll say, hey, I've been installing glands for years. I know exactly what we're doing. It's like, great, fantastic. And in many cases, they do. They do it extremely well. They don't need an awful lot of um, uh, hand-holding. But we've also had quite a few people that have come through that have been doing it for a long time, but they've been doing it wrong. 
and we show them how they're doing it wrong, and then they have to go back and show us how to properly do it. So again, a certified car mechanic would not be competent to work on a complicated hydraulic system. A residential electrician who wires uh, houses would not be competent to work on a drilling rig. Even though they have knowledge, they have some skills, but maybe not necessarily that behavior. So again, every job or position is different and require different skills or knowledge to be competent. Okay, and we have to demonstrate that capability. And at the end of the day, we need to be assessed. A, a real good example is the airline industry and where they get pilots. Generally, the pilots come from the military. They've had experience flying fighter aircraft or transportation craft or what have you. Then they go into the commercial sector and they say, okay, here's a 737 or an Airbus or whatever it is. They don't just automatically say, here, take off and, and do your thing. They go through additional training. They, they go through an assessment process where a senior pilot will actually fly with them. Uh, they go through that whole process in order to get qualified to be able to fly that particular plane. So again, it's the same thing that we're talking about with regards to EX. Oops, wrong way, sorry about that. So where did competency really come up I guess, and take a, take a much, much bigger uh, role, if you will, in the EX world. And we really can go back to basically in 1988 with the Piper Alpha uh, platform in the North Sea when it exploded. There was 167 people that lost their life. Um, the loss was about 3.4 billion and Occidental Petroleum who owned the platform pulled out of the North Sea shortly afterwards. And that particular rig accounted for about 10% of the total North Sea production. So going up until that point, when, when oil was discovered in the North Sea, it was a very fast and furious process. Uh, not to say that, that corners were cut or anything like that, but it was like, let's get out there. We need to get the oil. This is great. This is wonderful for the UK economy. And then all of a sudden this happened and everybody stood back and said, holy cow, uh, what did we do wrong? So what happened is that there was what was called the Cullen Report. And you can look online, you can download this report. And it took about two years to publish. And out of the Cullen Report, there was 106 recommendations that came out of it. And every single one of those recommendations were actually implemented by uh, all of the oil and gas companies, as well as the, uh, the health and safety executive in the UK. And part of it was determining that the employer need to now be responsible for the competency of its employees. So this was somewhat of a, a game changer, if you will. So all of the operators themselves that were existing in the North Sea, uh, immediately they started making assessments of their installations and management areas. The first off was the improvement of the permit to work management system and the initial uh, initiation of formal safety assessments. Now, going back to Piper Alpha, it was not an electrical issue that was actually the, the, the critical failure, if you will. Uh, it was actually more of a lockout tagout procedure um, in which a temporary flange was put on a compressor uh, and then that compressor was actually uh, energized or compressed and then the temporary flange blew off releasing a tremendous amount of gas onto the platform, which hit a source of ignition. However, all the electrical people for the other owner operators realized that, hey, this very well could have been an electrical issue. So all of the existing operators, the people like Shell, BP, SO, uh, BG, all of the existing operators, the technical authorities for all those organizations got together and they started looking and saying, hey, from an electrical and in instrumentation standpoint, what could we do better? And they determined, um, and it really was not a government driven thing, but it was more of a user driven program that they said, we have to implement competency for our individuals that are gonna be spending time on our rigs doing electrical work. That was the first competency program. And the name of it was called CompX and it was started in 1994 at Aberdeen College. Now, Compex lasted and still is to this day is still operational, but it, it kind of just sat there, if you will. There was a center in Aberdeen and uh, 
some other centers opened up in Northern Scotland, and this was basically more mandated by the owner operators. It was not a governmental mandated program. However, when the ATEX directives came into play in the early 2000s, one of the directives, the ATEX 153 directive, uh, basically has to deal with health and safety of the individuals that are putting into these facilities. They started mandating that people need to be competent, if you will. Um, in the UK, this was implemented as what was called the DSEER regulations, and this applied both to the onshore and offshore installations. And basically, what it really boiled down to was that if you, I was an employer and I was putting a person into my facility that hadn't been properly trained and assessed, that me as a company could be held liable for the damage that this individual could create. So therefore, through the threat of lawsuits and government intervention and all that good stuff, that's where the competency programs really started taking off. Now, the standards also had to reflect this information because now the competency is in there, the standards really had to uh, come up when define what are the levels of competency and where are they located. So the main standard that is used for design and selection of erection of electrical equipment is the 60079-14 standard. So if you're involved in EX, this is one of the most important standards to understand and follow uh, because it gives you all the details as to how, what types of glands to use and where I can use an EX piece of equipment based upon the zones and all this other good stuff. Well, in Annex A of the Dash 14, it actually defines levels of competency, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. The Dash 17 standard also includes information on competency and 17 has to deal with the inspection and maintenance. So once it's been commissioned, if you will, now that we carried on through the life cycle of that EX installation, 17 comes into play. So competency is also defined within the 17 standard. There's also now competency referenced in the 80079-34 standard. Now that standard, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, applies to manufacturers of EX equipment. So these are just three examples of where competency is showing up that can affect your design, your installation, your work. And in turn, what happens is that we will now start showing up in different country standards or regulations. So the regulators, just because a standard gets published doesn't necessarily mean that it is uh, the regulators follow it, right? I mean, a standard is written by a bunch of technical authorities or individuals representing a bunch of different industries that come together and come up with, in effect, a best practice. But it's really up to the regulators to make that determination of whether or not they're going to enforce that standard, right? So as we mentioned, the health and safety executive in the UK, they enforce that, those sets of standards, the EN or exactly the BSEN 60079 set of standards. And other organizations such as the United States Coast Guard are now starting to enforce these regulations or standards, if you will, and putting those into their uh, code of federal regulations or policy letters and other organizations as well, such as NOPSEMA in Australia. The important thing to note, however, is even though the regulators themselves may or may not enforce this, it's important to note that many uh, end users are now putting this as part of their boilerplate specifications that if you're a subcontractor, you need to comply with this. So if you do get a bid package in from a customer and it, it's one of the major oil and gas operators, do a quick search for competency and you very well might find some defined levels of competency within those specifications. So be aware of it. This is, uh, this is fairly new. This actually just came out about two weeks ago and here in the United States, the Coast Guard has actually issued this. And this is actually the first time that a US regulatory body is now really referencing competency as far as a regulation. And this applies specifically to LNG fueled ships. So there's a big move afoot all around the world to start using LNG as a fuel for tankers to get away from 
high sulfur content diesel, but not just tankers, but also for uh, carriers as well as even cruise liners. And the, the international standard that applies to these types of ships is the IEC 60092-502. And within that standard, it references the Dash 14, the Dash 17, and the Dash 19 standard. The Dash 19 standard has to deal with repair and overall, which also references competency. So the important thing is now a lot of the regulators are starting to really catch on to this and you're going to see more and more of this. All right. So Paolo, well, can you launch a it's poll? Very interesting so far. So uh, we want to make sure that you guys have been listening to what the Bob has been saying. So we have a question for you or a poll. Let me launch this poll so you can take a shot at answering it. What standard include define specific level of competency. I made this, uh, Bob, when I prepared this, a multiple choice. Uh, was I correct or wrong? Yeah, no, it is multiple choice. There's more than one right answer. Okay, good. I did it right. Because I still <laughs> you did. I cannot answer this question. I mean, oh, you can answer listen to you, of course. You, you can answer the question. Yeah, I mean, Okay, guys, you are, I see you are answering the question. You know, there's no judging, so please feel free to, you know, point, you know to <laughs> click yeah. one of those boxes or more than one of the boxes, okay? Okay, let's uh, end the poll. We have put most of your answer. We'll leave it a few more seconds. Okay, end the poll. And I share the result. What do you see here, Bob? Yeah, so that's good. Uh, there's actually, I think, a majority of you, obviously, were, were in the right uh, areas. The Dash 14, the Dash 17, and the Dash 34 all do define levels of competency. Mm -hmm. And actually, a little bit of a trick question, the 61508 and the 511 standards for functional safety also reference competency, although we don't talk about it in this webinar. The 10-1 standard is actually area classification, which we don't talk about in this webinar, but guess what? They also, there is some discussion about competency for when you're doing area classification. So actually all of the answers are correct. So. All right. Well, you know, it seems so obvious, but most people don't, you know, don't seem to, to get it. Uh, so let me, okay, you, you quit the poll, right? I did it. I did okay, it. fine. Uh, I mean, you know, if you want to get a job done on your car, you know, you're not going to go for a butcher or, you know, a barista. <laughs> Right. Mechanic, possibly a mechanic who has knowledge of your car. It's, obviously, it's so yes. obvious. But uh, in our world, you get so many people that are, you know, we in the sealed uh, in the IC sixty one five eleven courses that we run for competency. It is required you have prior experience, okay? Because you cannot teach in three days, you know, the the standards. And you just see how many people say, I just come out of school, I have no experience, can I still do it? You know, I can, you know, it's, right. everybody's which, trying to cut corners, you know. Which, which follow it, the same thing holds true in many of the competency programs. There are entry level competency modules, if you will, that somebody with no experience can come in and take it and go through it. Um, but then for other modules, and we'll talk about this here in a little bit, we expect in order to, to show and demonstrate your competency, you have to just, you have to not only prove it, but you have to show that you've had some experience in this. So work experience is, uh, is relevant to determine whether or not somebody is competent. Okay. So we, uh, we move forward now to uh, 2010 and, and here in the United States, uh, we had our yes. own version of Piper, Piper Alpha, right? We had Deepwater Horizon. In this case, we had 11 people died, obviously millions of gallons of oil spilled, and, and the economic impact was actually greater than $45 billion. And obviously it was, uh, it was something that we all, obviously here in Houston, we live with every day, but, but obviously it was front page news all over the world with the economic impact and, and obviously the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. So there was a, just like the Cullen report, there was a joint report by the two regulatory authorities over floating uh, platforms in the Gulf of Mexico. The U.S. Coast Guard is one of those organizations, and BESI, which is part of the, the U.S. Department of Interior, 
also has regulatory oversight in the offshore markets. And they came up with a joint report. <clears throat> and here was the key thing. Um, there was some electrical equipment on the uh, drill floor that was in very bad condition. And this was all based upon an audit that had been done not too terribly long before the explosion took place. And it was in poor condition and was left in hazardous areas. So the Coast Guard basically and Bessie came up with the point that there was no assurance that the electrical equipment was safe and could not have caused the explosions. Now, if you've seen the movie, uh, the movie actually fairly demonstrates the, the actual gas that there was intake into the engines. And they oversped, the lights turned brighter, and then eventually uh, caused the major explosion. But the US Coast Guard actually believes that the initial explosion took place on the drill floor. And then there was a secondary explosion that actually took place in the engine room. So just, just be aware, unfortunately, we'll never know exactly what happened. But obviously, uh, this was one of the theories that was, uh, that was put forth in the final report. So this is the important thing to think about, the certification of EX products. And, and I suspect that many of you that are participating here are probably designers or engineers. You know, we spend an awful lot of time selecting products, uh, making sure that they're suitable for the environment, doing all this great stuff. And we look at the certs and we do all this, but that's not the whole issue because the moment it leaves the, uh, that manufacturer's facility, and winds up in as part of a, a skid package or if it winds up as part of a, an overall project uh, scheme, it has to be installed properly. It has to be maintained properly. Um, it has to be designed for its intent. So the pictures that you see there, those are actually the first two pictures, left and right or center. Those are actually from an offshore oil rig in, the, in which a motor and a bell are located in a zone one area. And they were operational when these pictures were taken. And by the way, those, those pieces of equipment were only three years old when these pictures were taken. The picture on the right was actually from an onshore uh, drill rig, uh, land rig, if you will, using a cord connector going into a flame-proof box. So again, just because it comes out of the factory, it may be certified. If it's not installed properly, maintained, uh, we could have a lot of problems. So do we blame just the operational people, right? Is it just the folks that actually do the installation are at fault? In reality, it's not. Now, this was also a study that was done by the HSC, the Health and Safety Executive out of the UK. And they looked at the root causes of a lot of large industrial accidents. And if we notice the purple slide, it's specifications. Now, what does that mean, a specification? Well, that means that maybe the area classification was wrong based upon the gases, or maybe the specification for the equipment didn't properly reflect what the environmental conditions were. It could be a, a bunch of different things that could be classified as an issue with specifications. But if we look at the chart or the piece there that on um, installation and commissioning, it's actually a fairly small percentage of the actual root causes for some industrial, large industrial accidents. Now, mind you, this is only one study, and this was only done out of the UK, and it really applied to the control system side of things. But when we look at similar studies that have been done around the world at some of the root causes of large industrial accidents, it's very similar to what you see in this pie chart. So realize that even as a designer or an engineer, when we're designing systems or selecting products, that's where a lot of the faults and some of the root causes actually come into play. So when we actually do inspections, and I do inspections, my colleague here does a, a lot of inspections. That was actually one of his uh, major roles before he joined my, my company here a few years ago. Um, when we actually go in and do inspections, how many faults do we actually find? And what's, what's typical, if you will? And it's difficult to sometimes narrow that down, but generally speaking, we can see anywhere from about 20 to as much as 45% of the electrical equipment or instrumentation equipment, there is a fault. Now, mind you, when we say there's a fault, does that, I mean, you think 45% of the pieces of EX equipment that are out there there's a failure. 
Well, those failures are not necessarily critical or safety related failures. Uh, it could very well be something that where maybe a label is not appropriate or it's missing, or maybe tagging is not there. It's not necessarily a safety critical issue, but it is still an issue that needs to be addressed. But what are the causes? Again, incorrect selection, incorrect maintenance, poor maintenance, unauthorized incorrect modifications, again, lack of training knowledge. If we look at that panel over on the right-hand side, that's a great example. A, a zone two area in which a non-hazardous panel was installed into. So is that an issue for the designer, the engineer? Could have that been an issue for the installer? Somebody along the way should have said, hey, wait a minute, this is not right. And unfortunately it wasn't caught until it was actually located within that hazardous area. So fortunately it was eventually caught. So right. what is the leading root cause of major industrial accidents? Based you know, upon that spreadsheet or a flowchart. It's an easy question because you that. just show this uh, slide, but honestly, you know what I would say? That if we go back to the pie chart and we look at the different accident options, I would say most of them, or all of them, have to do with competency because a competent person will they avoid do. making mistakes in the design, engineering, maintenance. So it can happen accidentally, but when you are incompetent, and this is most of the time, you do it uh, because you don't know better. You know? That's right. It does. It, competency applies to all five of those areas, if you will. Um, so it, it is important. It's, in, it's important at every, every stage of the, the project life cycle, if you will. It starts very early on and it never ends until basically that, that project has been uh, decommissioned, if you will. Well, you, you guys have answered. The, there was only one uh, correct answer because the pie chart was very clear, but uh, let me show you what you have voted. And polling share result. Here we go. So most of you got the right answer, right, Bob? Right, right. Yeah. Some uh, believe differently, but honestly, as you said, this was HSC report. But I've right. seen other reports around the globe from by other authority and specification does come out as one of the leading cause of our accident. You just specify, and we have this experience as manufacturer of products. Take a C3 relay. You know, the, the customer will say, I want the C3 relay, full stop. Well, that's not sufficient information to give you the right C3 relay. We might give a C3 relay that operates in the opposite of what you needed, and then it's a C minus 3 relay, you know? Right. But, uh, it's, it's the specification are very important. We have actually a webinar we run with Tino on SRS, safety requirement specification, you know, how to write correct specification, because the majority of the time no. they are not. They are incomplete or wrong. Right. Okay. Uh, you have already stopped, uh, right? Yes. So I can yes. Fine, yes. let's continue. All right. So what do the standards say? Um, and if we look at the dash 14, again, this is the design selection and erection standard and it's in Annex A. It's not very long. It's only three pages, uh, but it's divided up into three different specific roles. So there's the knowledge and skills for a responsible person. So this could be a project engineer, project manager. Um, <clears throat> there's the operator technicians. Those are generally the individuals that are responsible for the actual assembly and installation. And then finally, there's the designers for the design and selection of the equipment itself. So within the standards, it will go and tell you a little bit more about what you should know if you're an individual that is a responsible person, a technician, or a designer, and it spells it out. And I won't go through all the details, but certainly uh, Annex A in the Dash 14 standard will give you all that information. And here's the important thing. There's an assessment requirement. So the competency shall be verified and attributed at intervals relevant to national regulations or standards or user requirements on the basis of sufficient evidence that the person A has the skill, can act competently, has the relevant knowledge and understanding. So here's the important thing to note out of the standard. Um, some people will say, and I don't want anybody to leave here to say that 
I told you that you must go through a, uh, a competency program like COMPEX or the IECEX COPC scheme. It does not say that within the standard. All it's saying is that the individual shall be assessed and how that assessment is done is really left up to the regulatory authority or that company. So that's the important thing to remember. Generally, the two main competency programs uh, do that. That's the assessment. That's what we do when we do, after we do the training and then there's the assessment portion of it. So, and they're both recognized to be able to do that. Now, since a lot of you are probably involved in intrinsic safety, um, the DASH 25 standard. So within the DASH 25 standard, this is the IS standard for intrinsically safe electrical systems. So part of generating an intrinsically safe system <clears throat> requires what is called a descriptive system document, a DSD, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit. And it says that the individual who does this shall be competent. So it's important to note that these competency requirements are showing up in a lot of different 60079 standards as well. Now this applies to the manufacturers. So if we have any manufacturers online, this standard, Edition 2, that came out in 2018, uh, this standard grew substantially, and this whole section on competence was added. Now, you might ask yourself, if I'm a manufacturer of EX equi equipment, I typically am going to have an auditor come into my facility and check my equipment to make sure that it's all correct and that I meet the requirements of the standards and it's all maintains its certification. However, what was happening is a lot of manufacturers were still sending out equipment that even though it had been third party certified or the auditors would catch it, they'd say, hey, there's a lot of problems still. So now the competency requirements are now floating down to the manufacturers of EX equipment. And again, that's, that's for a manufacturer. So that document, if you will, bolts on to your ISO 9001 quality module. So this is another requirement that has now been put into place for manufacturers of EX equipment. And we have to prove, you know, our there competency. Is on the competency. agency we have, you know, for the QAR and to UL, FM, it's part of uh, the process, not only the product, but the people. Same That's as right. in SEAL, you know, with TUV, we have SEAL certification, we have to prove that the uh, person that's doing the software, the person who's designed the component has the competency to do it. Otherwise. Right. An assessment is the best way, as you said. Or That's right. not a requirement to go for a certificate, but it's easier to assess. Okay, so coming on. soon, there is what is called an IEC technical specification that's going to be published in May of next year. And it deals specifically with personal competency. Now, I had the opportunity last week to speak uh, with the chairperson in that technical committee on the IEC to find out a little bit more. And he said it will not be an IEC standard. It will not start off as an IEC standard, but it'll come out as a technical specification. So it's more informative than a norm, if you will. But it'll take the relevant competency details from 14, 17, 19, and others and put it in a single format as a recommendation to follow. So again, now that we're seeing competency show up in a lot of these EX standards, now you'll actually see it uh, published as a technical specification. And again, this will come out in May of next year. That's what he says, that it's going to come out in May of next year. So to, to kind of move forward here, let's talk a little bit about what kind of programs are available, the differences. You've, you've, you may have heard of some of these. I mentioned COMPEX before. We all are probably familiar a little bit about what the IECEX is all about. So a lot of people are not familiar that the IECEX now has a personal competency program as well. But we'll talk a little bit about it. COMPEX, there's about 14 knowledge and assessment units. So some units are designed specifically for the operatives. Some units are designed specifically for the designers. And one module is actually developed specifically for those responsible persons. So these are straight out of the DASH 14, DASH 17 standards to meet those requirements. So the training and the assessment is based upon the Annex A in the DASH 14 standard. 
The most common is the 01 through 04 program, which is really for the operators and technicians, although it's not uncommon for engineers and designers to take it because they get a lot of practical information. So it's a combination of classroom and practical hands-on experience. The training and assessment are handled by two people within the same organization. So one person would do the classroom training, a second person would come in and actually do the assessments. The EX-12 is a design course and that's five days and that's all in a classroom type setting. There also are refresher programs and various other uh, variations of these. Now there are, uh, I believe at last count, there's 52 centers located worldwide. If you notice on the world map there on the right hand side, 27, 27 of them are actually located in the UK. It is a UK centric uh, organization owned by JT Limited, but it is worldwide. There are centers located in all parts of the world. The training and assessment are run by third party organizations and they're vetted, vetted and audited by JTL. And JTL determines the course content to deliver to be delivered by that third party. So under the IEC EX Certificate of Personal Competency, um, this has been around, where Compex has been around for about, I think since 1994, so what, 26 years now. The IEC EX Certificate of Personal Competency program has been around maybe for about 10, 11, 12 years. I'm, I may be a little bit off on that, but it's, it's a newer program. So there are actually 11 modules um, and the ones that are highlighted in blue, this is the one that we're actually going to be offering in conjunction with GMI, and we may be doing some additional modules as well. But the 001 is a fundamentals, and as Paulo mentioned, you know, you have to have experience to be able to go through various modules. Well, the 001 fundamentals one, you don't have to have any experience. You can come into it straight out of school, straight out of university, it's a two-day module. The 009, on the other hand, designing electrical installation, there is a prerequisite. And a prerequisite is to take the 001, but also in order to get your COPC for 009, you have had to have some work experience in the EX world, generally about two to three years of experience. So just be aware of it. Doesn't mean you can't take the course and you can't be trained but you not, may not be able to get your assessment and certificate around the 009 without having two to three years of experience. Now, the other modules are all set up to, to uh, train and assess around various other functions. And these are all based around, around the 60079 and the 80079 standards. So who actually runs this, the Certificate of Personal Competency Programs? So it's run by the EX certifying bodies and not all of the IEC EX certifying bodies are, uh, are approved, 15 have. And on the IEC EX website, you can actually go there and you can find out who are the EXCBs that are approved to give this. Now, it's as very similar to the product certification. The EXCB assesses the candidates based upon this operational document OD504. So if you want to know more about OD504, or if you're interested in the Certificate of Personal Competency, go ahead and go to the IECEX website, download that document, and it will tell you an awful lot about the COPC scheme and what is the training and what is the assessment required to meet those requirements. Now there's also what is called an IECEX recognized uh, training providers. Um, and there's a great question that I'll answer here in just a second, a question about the pricing between Compex and IEC EX. So we'll talk about that here in a little bit. The recognized training providers is a separate scheme. Um, there are 32 of us located worldwide. Now we're vetted to and approved by the IEC EX to deliver the course content. Now here's the important thing to note, the candidates are not mandated to be trained by a training provider. Uh, it is a competency scheme, not a training scheme. Now the training provider will provide the training to help you gain successful in going through the assessment, but there is no requirement that you actually have to be trained before being assessed. 
So you can go straight to an IECEX certifying body that is qualified as an IECEX COPC and say, I want to be assessed. So the benefit, however, of working with an RTP is that we have typically teamed up with an EXCB and we have, in our case, with a company called QPS Evaluation Services out of Canada, which is an IECEX certifying body, that they are the assessment arm, we are the training arm. And also because we know what they're going to be assessing you upon, uh, we've somewhat tailored our training content to make sure that you get the best chance of success. There's another question, difference or advantage of the IECEX COPC over Compex. So this is a little bit, some of the differences. Um, the, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, or what I should have told you on the Compex, um, for the practical side of things, they're basically the fixed centers. Uh, we all basically have to build it around the same <clears throat> layouts, if you will. And they're pretty much fixed for the practical assessments. So if you go to one compact center versus another one, it's all going to be very, very similar. It's not going to be exact, but it's going to be very, very similar. Now that's a good thing too, because the, the evaluation from center to center is basically a very similar process. So there isn't a big, if you get your COMPEX certificate from say, for example, Intertech who we work with, um, that carries the same weight as getting a COMPEX certificate from another uh, certifying agency under the COMPEX scheme. Under IECEX, there's a little bit more flexibility. Um, the modules can be fixed or portable. So as you see over there on the right-hand side, that's an example of a practical module for installation of EX, E, D, N, and I. So that's actually portable. We have those built that where we can take those to customers. Now each, each EXCB comes up with their own practical exercises approved by the IEC EX auditors. So it allows a little bit more flexibility by the certifying body, the training provider to come up with a better solution. And again, as I mentioned, the RTPs have teamed up with the CBs. The written exams, however, are all pulled from a common database. So the exams that you would take from a written standpoint are basically gonna be very similar to all of uh, whichever CB you end up going to. And again, not all EXCBs are approved for all modules. So depending on the module you wanna take, you wanna double check to make sure that A, does the training provider, if you wanna go that route, can they do the training around that module? And B, that the certifying body that you're using is actually certified to assess you against that particular module. So be aware of that. The certificates for both COMPEX and IECEX are valid for five years. Um, all of the IECEX certificates for the COPC are located on the IECEX website. So you can go there and you can download them just like you can a product certificate. So that's the important thing to note there. Again, competency is needed. Do your research on the training programs. Again, don't take my word for it. Ask questions, go do your research. Uh, certainly feel free to contact me. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have because again, we offer Compex and we do the IECEX as well. Remember that the training is not a requirement, uh, but the assessment is. And here's the key thing to remember, right? Uh, this, this EX chain, there's lots of areas that things can go wrong, right? As we've demonstrated and we've seen, we don't want you to be that weakest link, right? We spend all our time and money selecting uh, very expensive EX equipment, but if we don't apply it correctly, we don't install it correctly, we don't design it correctly, then it's all for naught, right? And we have to maintain it as well. So we don't okay, want you to do that. Bob, as, right. as, uh, why you go to the next slide for a second so that uh, people can get uh, through the recorded webinar and have our content details. But, you know, we have a lot of questions about the cost. You are very competent because you run both uh, programs. <laughs> right, right. So you cannot say what, which is better because, of course, you know, it's completing. But uh, yeah. and cost-wise, is there so much difference? Uh, people are claiming yeah. there's a big difference between CompX so, and ICX. There is. So, so to break it down a little bit, 
um, and this is actually when you, a lot of people are not aware of this, you can go to the IECEX website, you can find out exactly how much it costs to have the IECEX uh, issue a certificate. Now the issue, the certificate is actually done by the certifying body, but it's not, um, but there's a fee to play, pay to the IECEX. And, and I believe for every certificate that gets issued, regardless of it's a product or a person, I believe it's 250 Swiss francs, which comes out to around $250. Now, that means that if you ended up going through, say, 10 modules under the COPC scheme, the cost to issue the certificate for all 10 modules, if you did it all at once, would still be 250 Swiss francs. The cost is, under the IECEX, is that since there is assessment, that the certifying body has to charge X amount to grade your exams or do the assessment. And that is set by every single certifying body. So we also have uh, the training fee if people wanna go through the training side of things. So that's a separate fee. So generally speaking, I would say this much, Compex to do one through four, it, it ranges. It's up to every center to make that determination of how much they charge. Uh, because in the UK there's 27 centers right now, the cost is significantly less there than what you might find in other parts of the world where there's less competition. Generally speaking, I've seen prices on the Compex 1 through 4 ranging anywhere from a low of maybe twelve to $1,300 US to as high as maybe $2,200. So you really want to check which, which center, you know, that's where it's at. To do the equivalent under the IECEX would probably be somewhere in the neighborhood of around fourteen hundred to fifteen hundred dollars. Uh, but again, that's, like similar pricing. It's, pricing it's not that different. It's not outrageously different because you got to kind of compare apples to apples, right? Which modules you're taking. If you said I just want to take the 001, well, that's going to be less expensive than the Compax one through four. But if you say I want to combine a couple different modules then, okay, then it's more in line. The Compex Design course, there's not that many centers that offer that, and it's more expensive. Um, the equivalent IECEX COPC modules, the 001 and the 009 would be much less expensive. Um, so, okay, but, now, guys, you have a way to judge. Don't, uh, it's, uh, I, I guess uh, we can, uh, decision must be made on different uh, grounds also, you know, location, yeah, and, uh, can I find? Because they're basically recognition. We have a question about recognition. Both are recognized well. Um, it's both are yeah, so, plus and minus. Yeah. So I would say this much. The again, the standards. Um, it, it really depends on the regulatory agency of what they recognize, right? The standard doesn't say complex or IECEX. The standard says you must be competent. So it really boils down to the regulator in your country and or the client. And since Compex has been around much longer and it's been very much a UK centric, um, it started off very much in the UK, still has a UK background. A lot of UK oil and gas operators are using Compex as the basis for their saying, well, we want you to get your Compex. On the other hand, uh, the IECEX is taking off in other markets around the world, and you're seeing other clients around the world saying, well, we don't really know much about Compex. We like the IECEX COPC. So um, it really depends. You know, they both, they both are doing the same thing, if you will. It's really, um, it's up to the regulatory authority. It's up to the client, the end user. It's up to you. Mm -hmm. So you have that freedom and flexibility. Is there any difference? We have a question that uh, we haven't got to the question of pre-register and we are almost an hour, so we have to move a little bit faster. But there's a question about if there is difference in, in the program between if you are trying to mm, certify a product zone one or zone two, I, I think that, you know. No. The zone no, don't is, make any differences. Zone doesn't make any difference. Um, yeah. Um, Training in one location is same and valid for other locations and installation standards are and practices are different. Well, remember that the training that is done is based upon the Dash 14 standard and that's a generality. The 14 standard is in effect um, the basis for a lot of country specific standards, 
or wiring regulations. So there are some variations that you have to pay attention to. And I think we have a slide on this as well. Um, so somebody's asking yeah. about on-site training. I believe we can provide on-site training. We can do, we call it, uh, I forgot what we call it. But yeah. Then, yeah, we can come out to you and do the training depending on the number of person. But today might be a little difficult because of this COVID scenario. We used to do it all the time. We might come back and do it after the summer. Let's see what happens. You yeah, just contact me, us me or contact me or Bob uh, to, for details. Okay, yeah, so Rob, you, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say to answer that question, the question on, on, on doing this virtually or doing it on site, it can be done either way. The virtual one we're working with right now to try to make it to where we can offer certain modules in a webinar type forecast. Uh, but absolutely, the COPC modules can be offered remotely. And that is part of, uh, so that can be taken in, in various locations around the world. Yeah. So here are some questions that we got during the registration. If you guys have another 10, 15 minutes to stay with us, we we'll try to move through them fast. Uh, the first question was, uh, I'm a design, I'm a designer in first in the ICX comps PC. What module would you recommend? Well, right. here we go. Yeah, the 001, as I mentioned, that's the fundamentals. And that's typically about a day and a half of training. The actual exam is a written exam. You're, you're given about three and a half hours to take the written exam. And by the way, the COPC, uh, program is open book, open note, where some of the complex modules are not. So what pe some people might ask, is the exam under the COPC more difficult, less difficult? It's actually probably a little bit more difficult, but it is open note and open book. The design course would be the second one that I would do. And that's again, about a day and a half of training uh, and about three hours and 30 minutes for the exam on the design. So you could do an 001 and an 009 in basically a four day type. If you wanted to do the training and assessment, if you said, I just wanted to be assessed on the 001 and the 009, then that could be done in a day. Okay. Let's and there's, see. there's ways of combining different modules, depending on what people really need. Yeah. What is better? Well, <laughs> and also we have question here live they said who what which is best recognized we have this question yeah. answered already obviously different company might require different you know it's all it's I all up to the, your customer right maybe. there there are so most people know compex out there in the world and there's about i think at last count for the compex one through four which is the one that most people are are, are know about I think at last count, there's something around 80,000 people that have gone through that program wow. worldwide since it started. Now, 80,000, you have to go through it every five years. So there's 80,000 people that have, been, I don't think it's 80,000 people. It's, you know, oh, you might have had one person have gone through it three times, but they've issued 80,000 certificates in the last 20 some odd years. The COPC is probably issued at this point. You can go to the IECEX website and you can find out the exact number, but I think it's probably more like uh, 10 to 15,000 or so. Now it's only been around a shorter period of time. Um, and again, they're both great programs. It's really what works best for you and what's, what's recognized by yourself or your client. I, I would say this much. There's a really good thing about Compex in the standpoint that it is very consistent amongst centers. The IEC EX, because there's a lot more freedom and flexibility, that's a good thing and a bad thing. So for example, when we do the COPC thing, uh, modules, we'll actually do, if we have say one customer from one company that wants to do the COPC, we might customize it a little bit more for their application. And we have that freedom and flexibility under the COPC where well, we don't necessarily have that freedom and flexibility under the Compex. Okay, another question we got was, uh, we've been prodded according to IEC 879.34, and I've been told we need competency by a certified agent, so third party assessment. What are my options? Well, I think <laughs> we discussed this option throughout the entire webinars. Yeah, now it, here's the thing. Both the COPC and Compex right now don't have modules established 
specifically to meet the requirements of 80079-34. We have put together independently, but it's not a, a COPC or a COMPEX, a program specifically for manufacturers. But remember what 7-2 in the uh, 80079 standard doesn't say that it has to be a third party assessment. It can be done internally. And most companies, quite frankly, that's what they're doing. I think you guys are doing that at GMI. You're doing training and assessment of your candidates to make sure. So yeah, yeah, we that. have a, a training, an internal training program and assessment. We have uh, obviously to keep updated. I want more info on the ICX Comp CC. Well, you can go online, yeah. I guess, Bob. Right? Yeah. So I mentioned the OD five hundred four. Uh, that's an operational document you can download. If you say, I, I'm really interested in doing this, go to the OD-502. That's your application form. It'll tell you all the things that you would need to fill out. The 521 is the uh, IECEX recognized training provider program. So that's the document that I had to go through in order to become an RTP. But really the main one would be the OD-504. That will answer a lot of questions and certainly drop us notes and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Yeah. Uh, I want to find out more about CompX. That's yep. a website for the CompX. Yep. Yep. You can go there and that you can link, you can find out all the centers. And I would suggest, you know, you don't register through CompX to take a course. You actually register through the various centers. So each center operates independently. So you can reach out to all of the various centers and they're all listed on the CompX website and uh, in find out what their schedules are, what they offer, how much they charge, do all that good stuff. We had a question from a registrant who said, we are involved in SEAL application. Where is competency referred to? Well, we have answer to that, obviously. Okay. It is yeah. referring both standards, 61508 and 511. That's it right. It used to be assured, so if possibility now is a shall in addition to those standards. So you must have competency. Yes. It's a mandatory requirement also for functional safety. Where would you recommend an engineer to go if they wish to learn how to design a circuit to be intrinsically safe? This was very recent. One of the last registrants posed this question. Well, it's a tricky question. We can yeah. tell you how to do our job. <laughs> So there, that's, an, that's a good question because, um, so the design of an IS circuit, right? The requirements within the Dash 11, how to build and design intrinsic safety associated apparatus. So if I wanted to build a, a barrier, I'm gonna follow the requirements of Dash 11. That's not part of the competency programs of, as part of COMPEX or the COPC. Um, however, we do talk about in both of the programs, what is intrinsic safety, what constitutes it, all this other good stuff. However, the application design of an IS system is part of both the Dash 14 and the Dash 25, where it does specifically state that the person who's designing the system shall be competent. So COMPEX covers that within the COMPEX EX12 module, and it's also part of the COPC EX009 design module. So that's we spend time creating a DSD and show you how to create your DSD in the 009 module. And that's also part of what is most of the centers will have as part of their EX12 module. Right. In this next question, interested to know what company is required to be an expert in EX design. So basically a similar question to what we got in the few right. just now. And we so, said, you know, the best way is to join a company like GMI and learn, but. Yeah, there you go. Uh, and, and Annex A of Dash 14 basically defines and spells out. Uh, sorry, we lost Bob for a second. Okay, you're back. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no problem. You find out Annex A and it defines levels of competency of what it's expected for a designer and engineer. How can I commission the intrinsic safety loop and which documents should be collected in the loop check file? We are getting close to an hour and five minutes, so we still have a few moments if you guys want to stay with us. So what is a DSD or descriptive system document, Bob? Yeah, so this is a, a spreadsheet that we have that I've used and uh, uh, 
there, it, this is also something that is on GMI's website. It's not a spreadsheet. Yeah, we do. Like yes. this. Yeah. A um, little different look, but we do have a, a similar concept, right? We call this it the uh, AX loop check, but yeah, okay, not DSD, but it's similar, I guess. Well, you use this to develop your DSD. So I think on the next slide, we actually show what is a DSD, but we plug in this? the information. There, yeah, there's your DSD. There's an example, right? So if you go back to the previous slide, it'll, it'll, you, you have your device data. So in this case, a real world example, we used a, a, a little beacon from a company called E2S. We have our parameters that are given, that are listed by the CERT on the CERT. It gives us all that information. Then we take the information from the barrier. Uh, in this case, we use a 1041Q. Uh, we pull all the information from there in the yellow cells. So we load in all that information. And then we also have to input the cable information because sometimes people forget that cable does contain uh, capacitance and inductance and we need to take that into account when we do our DSD. We plug all that information over on the right hand side if we see all the OKs that means our entity parameters are good and then here's the key thing if you notice in the middle of the screen we see 179. What that is telling us that is telling us based upon the device, the end device, as well as our barrier and the cable information that we have plugged in, the maximum length of meters of cable is 179 meters. So that means that our DSD should reflect that our cable installation should not be any greater than 179 meters, right? That's basically what this is telling us here. So when we, and this is all based upon a gas group 2C, which is the most onerous. If we change the parameters for two, to make it 2B, the information on the barrier data would actually change and our length of cable would also change as well. Will so increase. It will we increase. We have a specific uh, webinar on this also. Okay, next uh, question. I lost control of my slides. What did I do? Oh. Okay, here we go. Okay, so this was the example of the DSD. Right. You put together the information. Okay, let's see next question. Uh, I would like to have more insight on the best practice that we need to follow to make design compliant for EX condition. Hmm. All right. Yeah, enough? that's a, I, yeah, I think we answered. I'm not really sure. <laughs> So again, go back to 14 and 17. Um, there's also the 46 assemblies. But here's the important thing to remember too. Remember those standards, if you will, are somewhat generalities. They get adopted within the wiring regulations in various countries. So if I'm in the UK, I'm also going to be following BS 7671. If I'm in Australia, I need to know AS 3000. If I'm in the US, uh, I want to follow the National Electric Code and the Canadian Electric Code for Canada. So the best way, if you will, is obviously go through those standards. Also make sure that you get the latest wiring regs in that particular country and see how these standards kind of inter intersperse with the wiring regs. So in some cases like the UK and Australia, they, they reference the 60079-14 standards and 17 standards. Uh, the NEC and the CEC do as well. Um, so you, you will find that in there. Okay, I think one of the last questions because it's time for us to, to let our guests go back to their job or back to dinner, whatever it is. I would <laughs> like to attend some of your other webinars, but they are not in the right time zone. Okay, will there be access to this webinar at a later time? Yes, there is. We are registering all our webinars, including uh, today's, and they are available on our YouTube channel so you can go there and really look at all of our webinars and use them to learn or to fall asleep with <laughs> <laughs> and this is our live webinar schedule so we have a lot of live webinars coming up we will continue through the summer and so far schedule is uh, for august i believe but we're also going to have webinars in september so we continue yeah and we're putting some other ones as well together on some other topics that we think will be of interest as well so 
you yeah. know, make sure you go to the GMI website, uh, bookmark that page, keep checking it out uh, because we will be posting some more webinars as well. So. Yeah, and you guys let us know how we'll be doing today and also keep in mind, you know, if you do have some specific requirement for a webinar that you haven't seen so far, as Bob's mentioned, just drop us an email, let us know, and we will try to, you know, to see if you can do it. Uh, we've been yeah. also organizing uh, on-demand webinars for some customers, uh, where there's a lot of end users, for example, that have specific uh, subject to cover and specific timing requirement. So let us know. Well, today looks, I thought I messed it up several times today, but <laughs> you guys, we have the best uh, ratings thus far for all our webinars. Let's see if we can remain until the end. <laughs> and, and the polling. And the polling. And the now. polling, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hand the poll. And the poll. we have 100% excellent reply. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. I mean, I get a lot of people send us uh, email after the webinar, say your competence is unmatched. You're a very competent person, very easy to listen to. And, you trust okay. with a lot of knowledge. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> well, thank, thank you, guys, to be with us. We are always uh, here, so you can contact us at any time, and we'll see you next time. Ciao. Take care. Good day to everybody. Bye-bye. Ciao. Bye-bye.